Hello, welcome back. Today's topic is asset and liability valuation. So we're going to dive into each of the financial statements, including the balance sheet, as well as the income statements. So let's go ahead. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about asset and liability valuation principles. Um, the the um, term that we sometimes use is called mixed attribute measurement model. Um, it sounds like a mouthful. What that really means is that for different kinds of asset and for different kinds of liabilities, we may use a different valuation approach. So the reason is our goal is to provide both relevant and representative and also faithful information. So that's and sometimes, so those are the two goals. So relevant and reputational, representationally faithful. Unfortunately, these two goals are not always, always consistent. So we're going to take a closer look at that. Both the US GAAP and IFRS, they require firms to use more than one approach in order to value assets and liabilities to accomplish this goal. So let's take a, an example. Let's take a look at um, asset and liabilities and how and what model we can use to value them. So some asset and some liability we can use historic cost, whereas others we may want to use um, a more custom valuation model that is based on present value of future cash flows. And you may have seen some of this already in the past. Um, on the income statement side for revenue, expenses, gains and losses, um, the concept of accrual accounting, um, that is the goal is there to match revenue and expenses. Um, so that will, that sometimes that may um, lead to using the accrual or deferred value. And then yet other um, types of expenses um, are amortization. So they are amortized. So again, these are different models. So um, as it happens, so that will be a cash basis, accrual or deferral, that's, another, and that's, to, that's again a matching principle, um, as well as amortization. Because we have all these different types of valuation approach, so once again to summarize, for asset and liabilities, we can use historic costs versus other measurement, um, and for revenues and expenses, we can use accrual or deferral or amortization. Um, these are the different types of approaches because in one statement, one item may be value in using one method and another item on the same statement may be value using a different method. That's what leads us to call this mixed attribute measurement. So we said that our goal is to have a relevant and represent, representational faithfulness. So what are they and why do we need uh, and what are the trade-offs? So relevance, it refers to the fact that the information we are looking at is timely and also is useful, uh, is, it may affect a user's decision. So that's relevance. So remember that in financial statement analysis, our focus is not just in presenting the information, but rather using the information to make investment decisions. So relevance is important from that perspective. Representational faithfulness means that the information that we present has to be supported by documents. And this document can be original documents, so this would be source documents, or they are market information. So um, it's a widely publicized and available market prices. And then there can be also other um, credible evidence or a third party valuation, for example. So representational faithfulness has to do with objectivity and uh, ability to be well documented. 
Our goal is to help users make decisions, so uh, based on financial statement information. And we want to be able to use this information for us to determine the risk, um, timing, um, certainty, and size of cash flows that will be generated in the future, which will then be in term affect the value of the asset today. So the, here comes the trade-off. Um, historical values are oftentimes the easiest to verify because your purchase cost was documented in a contract. However, in some cases, historic values are not relevant. Fair market value oftentimes are estimated. And even though they're more relevant, the estimation can be subject to error and also assumption and potential biases. So this is the trade-off that we have to keep in mind as we decide um, which valuation method to choose for a particular item. So let's take a look at some example. So that may help clarify the concept. Some situation historic cost is the correct approach to use because it's both relevant and also representationally faithful. Uh, an example of that, a lot of them are in the current asset and current liability um, category because these are relatively, um, uh, again, current accounts are um, asset that will be that can be converted into cash within one year and liability that has to be paid within one year the short time frame makes the historic cost um, relevant uh, on the other hand historical cost can is representationally faithful but less relevant and this typically has to do with um, accounts that are longer in 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 in, in life um, and one particular example is inventory inventory is a current asset account but you can choose to use lifo or fifo so lifo is last in first out so if you use lifo in inventory valuation you can you could potentially create a situation where the value that is in the inventory account is very very old and it has not relevant to today's um, replacement cost um, other examples are more obvious um, research and development uh, intangible assets those are the historic cost is seldom uh, relevant because they are not directly linked to the the, the value of the current uh, asset in other cases, uh, we may find that fair value is both relevant and represent, representationally faithful. And this is the most often the case where market value is easily accessible. Uh, so therefore, market bulls, securities, commodities, any financial assets that is traded in a liquid market, um, you can get the market price quite easily. And if the market is liquid and is in a well um, uh, well-regulated situation, uh, those prices can easily be documented. Unfortunately, more often than not, fair value is relevant, but is not as represent uh, is not as easy to ascertain is representational faithfulness. So it's not that they are not representationally faithful, but it is uh, they the degree varies. Um, we're going to take a look more at the at um, at when fair value is more or less representationally faithful. Uh, some examples include real estate valuation. Um, others are internally generated um, estimation, uh, pension plan. Um, again, because the asset may be invested in illiquid illiquid investments, so this could be in a um, private equity firm um, or in a real estate investment. So those type of investments are typically not, not, not liquid or doesn't have a very liquid market. So the price is a lot harder to ascertain. So let's take a look at um, the three levels. So all these are fair value estimates. Um, level one 
is one where we consider the um, degree of representational faithfulness is high. So this, once again, will be where prices, even though the asset itself are not traded in the liquid market, um, identical assets or liabilities is easily traded, uh, is, is actively traded, and therefore you can make a compar comparison in terms of um, valuation. Level two will be less in, in terms of degree will be slightly less representationally faithful. And this includes, um, again, prices that are observable in similar assets. So the difference between the first and the second is similar versus identical. Um, so, for example, if you have um, a government bond, but it, that particular bond is not liquidly traded, but another bond that has the same maturity day, same coupon is traded, then you can just use that value. A uh, similar asset is they are similar, but may not be identical. So um, a real estate investment could be one of those because you, you may be invested in one real estate. Um, that particular uh, piece of real estate has not been traded, but another piece of real estate in the same market has recently been transacted. Then the most recent transacted price can be used to approximate um, the particular asset that's owned by the firm. And then the last, level um, and this is doesn't mean that this is always low but it can be either high or low and this is where the judgment part and the act part comes in in valuation um, a lot of times and uh, level three fair value estimates uh, rely on assumptions so you may have to estimate future cash flow you may have to estimate discount rate in order to compute present value. In that case, it depends on the reliability of those estimates and whether or not those estimates can be um, traced back to source documents. So again, future cash flow, how are they generated? Um, all those estimates, are they based on actual historical forecasts? So there's a lot of um, judgment factors involved in terms of determining whether or not a particular value, uh, fair value derived using assumptions have high or low representational faithfulness. So again, discount rate, how much um, objective data do you use to estimate that and how much subjective da uh, data is used to estimate that. Another important um, estimate for valuation in addition to fair, fair market value is the concept of replacement cost and resale value. So re replacement cost is um, the amount that a firm will have to pay in order to replace um, the same asset. And this typically um, is most relevant for real assets. So a piece of equipment, um, if, if the firm has, uh, which is vital to the production and function of the firm, then the replacement value may be, uh, may be the most relevant value. Uh, and also replacement cost oftentimes is quite easy to document. You can get a quote, the price may be available publicly. Resale value is the amount that a firm can get if a, an asset is liquidated. Um, Resale value is a little bit harder to come by. Uh, again, you can use comparative um, um, uh, value, just we talk about real estate, uh, but replacement cost is a little bit easier because you are buy if you're buying the same equipment from the same vendor, it's pretty, uh, the representational faithfulness is very easy to ascertain. Next, let's take a look at what U.S. GAAP and IFRS have to say about valuations. As far as historic cost is concerned, the most obvious is acquisition cost. And this will apply to land, intangibles, um, and any prepayments. 
In addition to acquisition costs, you can also use an adjustment, um, and this is most relevant for buildings, equipment, and also natural resources that are subject to depreciation. So it can be a depreciated historic cost. Another historic cost is the initial present value. So if you purchase a bond, the price you pay for the bond is not the nominal value of the bond or the principal of the bond, but rather the present value. So that's the cash that you pay for. Um, and so again, these are the typical asset that you will use the initial present value as the historical cost. For fair value, most of the time is the market value or fair value. And we talk about that. So this will typically include financial security. So equity securities, that is how for, um, for investment, um, the same um, for liabilities, as well as um, options and futures that you use for hedging purposes. A lot of times you may use a hybrid method. So for example, the current replacement cost would be used as the value. Um, and then if you're looking at a liquidation or resale value, um, that will be um, all the net realized value. That's part of that as well. So one of the, one of the example is for inventory. Um, you can use either the cost or the fair value, and you're going to use the lower of the two. Uh, the same goes for accounts receivable. You will want to take into account um, estimates for uncollectible accounts. So this is this is not a 100% historical cost because there is an adjustment for uncollectible accounts, which is a uh, a subjective estimate. Now let's take a look at a real life example on how does this valuation um, may impact um, your use of the financial statements. So here we have two companies and importantly, both companies have the same or similar market value. So the market value of both company is about $700 million in year two. And we'll notice that for the company on the left-hand side, the market value is quite close to that. So let's go in a little bit. So for this company, this is um, the company's name is Blackwell BlackRock Kelso Capital. This is a private equity firm. And if you look at its assets, most of the assets are um, interest receivable, um, investment and fair market value. So non-control, non-affiliated investment. That's really the majority of its asset. So most of its assets are value at fair market value. So it indicated cost, um, but this is using fair market value because it says right here, investments at fair market value. And because most of these assets are value using fair market value, um, their equity, you can say total net assets here, um, is very close to the $700 million. On the other hand, the company on the right, its name is Halosyme. This is a biopharmaceutical company. And most of its um, activities has to do with research and development for new pharmaceuticals. So you will see that for its assets, um, it actually have um, relatively few uh, value at fair market value. Um, in fact, you see that um, a lot of it is in prepaid expenses and other assets, right? So that's not um, that's not easily valued. And also, a lot of the uh, net property and and equipment are likely to have been highly depreciated. So is book value for equity is 48 million, 
whereas the market value is 700 million. So there's a huge discrepancy between the two. Um, and that is, um, again, we're going to use those information and compare it to what we know about the um, nature of the firm, the market, the um, life cycle, um, the market value of the firm, and also the, um, uh, the strategy. In the next video, we're going to go over some actual examples of how do we do valuation. See you soon.